Hi, this is Marion Waldman with Teach My Kid to Read, and I am so excited to introduce Debbie Meyer as part of our Road to Decode 2020 Dyslexia Awareness Month free presentation series. She's going to present Dyslexia 101 for parents, pediatricians, social workers, librarians, and school staff. Let me tell you a little bit about Debbie. Debbie Meyer is a founding member of the Dyslexia Plus and Public Schools Task Force, a small group of community leaders working to help students with dyslexia and related language-based disabilities thrive in their neighborhood schools. In 2018, she was named as a Columbia Community Scholar to look at the intersection of dyslexia and mass incarceration and the role of universities in changing the trajectory of struggling readers. Debbie's lengthy professional career is in nonprofit management and fundraising. She lives in central Harlem with her dyslexic husband and son, Debbie Meyer. Thank you, Marian. I'm really happy to be here. I'm about to share my screen and uh, let's see, can people put questions in the uh, YouTube chat uh, later on? Yes. Okay, so um, when you have questions, go ahead and put them in the YouTube chat and I'll be checking that from time to time and hopefully get your answers in. Take care and enjoy the presentation. So I am really excited to be here and share what I've been learning as a Bundles Community Scholar at Columbia University and as a parent of a dyslexic kid in New York City. I do want you all to grab a pen and paper because we're gonna be doing some uh, exercises uh, pretty soon. But in the meantime, think about these questions. And please, as I said, feel free to remark um, in the chat feature on YouTube. Do you know anyone that won't go to a library or a bookstore to get a book? Or anybody that only looks at headlines or pictures in a newspaper or magazine? Maybe someone that is really nervous to read aloud at Passover Seder. Do you know people that seem to read okay to get by, but just can't spell? You get an email or a text from somebody and you just wonder about all the misspellings. Did you know that most things in our society are written at what is considered eighth grade reading level? Well, most things, except ballot initiatives, they are written at 15th grade level. And nationally, 66% of eighth graders do not read at eighth grade level. In New York State, 73% of eighth graders do not read at eighth grade level. New York City School Chancellor Carranza said last year, literacy is a social justice issue and should lead the equity agenda. I couldn't agree more. Also, I'm going to argue that Poor instruction is a public health crisis. Recently, in a presentation by Nadine Gabb of Harvard, a slide said, literacy is a widely recognized predictor of health outcomes, connecting with academic, social, career access, and economic success measures. And this was clear in New York City during COVID-19 spring. Further, you are effectively disenfranchised when you can't access information to base your vote on. These are just some of the social ills underliterate people face. This is what I'm going to discuss today. There's so much I could put in a literacy presentation. I had to make some choices. I'm not going to be offering a lot of the signs and symptoms of dyslexia, but I'll happily answer questions on that and the myths about dyslexia. You'll get my contact information at the end. This is also not a review of all these scripted literacy programs or specific resources, but I will highlight the hallmarks of evidence-based literacy work. This presentation is aimed at creating advocates for better literacy instruction, and I hope you'll find it helpful. So to start, we will look at literacy instruction through the years. You'll see by the colors of the text, it has come in waves. Whether the earth is round or flat, whether climate change is real, whether vaccine and now masks contribute to public health, and how to teach reading are all arguments between people that read, that believe in science, data and evidence, or people that don't. But with the science of reading, it's even more tricky. We have people that believe in teaching science classes, but not, are not invested in the science of reading. At the beginning of the last century, we began to understand how important synthetic phonics was. 
but the psycholinguists, an elite group led by Arthur Gates from Columbia's Teacher College, thought this was drill and kill. Some of you might remember Dick and Jane. Memorization of repeated words and semantics was enough, they said. Repetitions and predictability of whole words would build a bank of words a student could rely on. But phonics advocates rebelled and more scientific research began. Dr. Samuel Orton and Anna Gillingham at TC, Teachers College again, provided much of this research and created rules for the synthetic phonics codes to teach decoding words and sounds into symbols and, and syllables, along with spelling and or encoding. They understood the importance of semantics and language work as well. Diana King implemented this at Sidbury Friends in Washington, DC with all the struggling and reluctant readers. In short time, these kids were reading and writing better than their friends who were being taught with whole word. Clearly, we needed phonics and semantics, word work and sentence work. But the psycholinguists adjusted and came back with whole language, predictable books, leveled readers, no phonics, just memorization of words and using cues from pictures and other words to build a word bank in your brain. Then in the 1990s, when California experienced a notable decline in reading proficiency, Congress called for a national reading panel of experts to examine the best practices in reading instruction. The panel reviewed 100,000 studies and published a comprehensive report. Scientists, again, recommended phonics and semantics, but they weren't clear enough, and this was not implemented well. In response to the panel's recommendations, we got not very balanced literacy that is considered by many to be whole language in sheep's clothing. And we got independent phonics programs that don't work well in isolation. Still, people that can afford tutoring or specialized schools can benefit from the science of reading based on Orton and Gillingham's work that was proven several times over with functional MRIs that highlight the neurobiology and neurodiversity in acquiring reading skills. Currently, our instruction does not align with our service-based economy, which requires reading to be successful. I keep wondering, what if the science of reading, AKA structured literacy, was taught well and available in every school? Dr. Seuss, in an interview for Arizona Magazine in 1981, discusses how he was limited by his publisher to using 220 specific words from the Dolch list of sight words when he created the cat in the hat. This is what he says about phonics and about having children memorize sight words. Yet, this is not so much a Dewey problem. This is really a 1930s Arthur Gates problem and later Noam Chomsky, Frank Smith, Ken and Yetta Goodman, psycholinguist influence problem. And it's currently a Heinemann Publishing, Pontus and Pinnell, Richard Allington, and historically Lucy Hawkins and TC influence on instruction problem. And of course, the main problem is that teaching colleges around the country do not prepare teachers in the science of reading, and many teachers just have to wing it. I realized that the two places where my son really learned to read had their own teacher training institutes. I knew the fight was less with teachers and more with the teacher preparation programs. K-3 teachers are not licensed by their ability to teach reading. Instead, training for new and student teachers gets watered down as, quote, experienced teachers train the younger teachers in the classrooms. Those teachers who are lucky enough to learn from a professor that understands literacy instruction usually land at schools where principals still want to use some form of balanced literacy and the teachers must comply. In the last few months, Lucy Calkins and her colleagues at TC um, RWP, the Teachers College Reading and Writing Work uh, Program, have been learning more about the neuroscience, structured literacy instruction, and the science of reading. But still, their workshops and publications and trainings are still leaving literacy advocates scratching their heads. So we'll start with neurodiversity. There is neurodiversity in how we learn to read. How do we know this? Earlier, I told you we had functional MRI brain scans and we have reading scores that match. But I'm not showing you brain scans because they are very difficult for lay people to really decode. 
Rather, I'll explain neurodiversity. You have probably met people that picked up chess or checkers very easily and can see three or four or more moves ahead. Other people have trouble memorizing patterns each chess piece moves or make one move before considering the next in either game. And those Rubik's cubes. You've probably seen people that twist so quickly you can't track what they are doing. Others memorize patterns. Some never get it. If I had functional MRI brain scans taken when people were engaged in these activities, you would see different parts of their brains active depending on whether they were talented at these or not. With music, some people have natural talent, some learn it, some are incredibly tone deaf. Same with rhythm. My aunt tells me that as a young child, she took piano lessons for years and years and never got very good. She would be frustrated when my father sat down and played by ear beautifully. My father could play any instrument by ear, it seems. My mother had very little musical talent. My sister got the musical talent in our family. I did not. All of this is to explain that people's brains have different strengths. Much of this is neurobiological and much of this is hereditary. There is neurodiversity in learning reading skills as well. Like the other examples, it is really on a continuum. And studies show that your predisposition for literacy acquisition is about 50% hereditary. Reading and spelling are no more natural than solving a Rubik's cube. It hasn't been around in the scope of things much longer really than the printing press. Gutenberg's came around 1440, which is pretty recent in human history. On this chart, you'll see that some people learn reading very easily. 35% are kind of the neurotypical. These are the students who our instruction is currently aimed at. What is broad instruction? It can be anything that is watered down, invented by teacher with help from Pinterest, good programs delivered poorly, to programs that are simply antithetical, like Fontes and Pinnell and historically Teachers College reading and writing program, which didn't really include a phonics program. It can even be poorly conceived or poorly delivered remediation programs. But those in the dark area need really good instruction. Our literacy and scores are evidence that we are not getting really good instruction. Some people blame the test, but when eighth graders are scoring at second or third grade level, it can't be the test. We are gonna talk about what good instruction is shortly. And these are the dyslexic students. You will hear different prevalence rates from different experts. They say five to 12% of the population, some say 10 to 15%, others say 20%. Almost everyone agrees that it constitutes about 80% of all learning disability. And we know if one parent is dyslexic, there's a 50% chance a child will be as well. We also know that because of generations of poor instruction in learning to read, we will see how this is not only hereditary, but social and educational. I'll pause here for another second for you to look through the infographic a bit longer. This is the second important infographic. It is known as Scarborough's Reading Rope. It explains how we learn to read well. I'll be referencing it in later slides. Science tells us that we need word recognition which begins with phonemes and syllables to build phonological awareness. How many of you know how many syllables there are in the word silence? Now, how many do you know, of you know how many phonemes there are? There are six. Can you hear them? S, I, O, E, M. Phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition, or connecting sounds to symbols, are what make up word recognition. When they're woven together well with good direct instruction and with language comprehension, a student can learn to read. This is the simple view of reading. Reading is the product of both. If one is zero, the product is zero. If one of the rope strands is weak, we have problems everywhere. Most teachers understand the top part of this reading rope. 
Those are good strategies when a student is reading to learn at third or fourth grade. Very few teachers and early educators understand the bottom of this reading rope, and they're not prepared to implement the good instruction this requires so students can learn to read. This presentation will discuss more about the bottom half because that's where most teachers are not prepared and is where most dyslexic students need extra instruction, not less. This section of the presentation is about dyslexia. The IDA defines dyslexia as a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language from the reading rope we just talked about, and is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede the growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. However, Without effective instruction, kids with dyslexia and low IQs struggle with phonological issues just like the mid-range and high IQ kids. The amount of effective classroom instruction needed, the amount of repetition may vary. We'll talk about effective classroom instruction next, but first I have some work for you. Please get your pen and paper ready. Most dyslexia presentations use complicated simulations with nonsense words. I'm using an example from regular English. Please write down these words in a list. Cough, like when you have a cold. Rough, like sandpaper. Through, like you go through a tunnel. Though, like however or nevertheless. And plow, like you plow snow or plow a field and smell it both ways. Say them out loud a few times. Do they rhyme? Do they look like they should rhyme? Now, switch your, hand, your pen to your non-dominant hand and write baloney like the sandwich meat. And pony like a small horse. Do they look like they should rhyme? Continuing with your non-dominant hand, write the words consequences and paradoxes. Yeah. Writing with your non-dominant hand takes longer. What else is different about your unnatural hand? Did you think about each letter and how to form it? Now let's write another list. Go back to your strong, your dominant hand. Let's write aid, like help, or band-aid. Tray, something you carry things on. Table, where you might set the tray down. Sunday, what you make out of ice cream and what might be on the tray. Cake, what else might be on the tray? Pray, what an eagle hunts. Break, what happens if you drop the tray? And eight, the number after seven and before nine. What do these words have in common? Okay, I have five more words for you in a new list. Lemonade. Sunday, the day of the week where some people go to church. Pray, what some people do at church on Sunday. Brake, what a car or bike needs to stop. And eight, like we did to the cake in the Sunday. Did you really know how many ways we have to spell long A? What about how many homophones we have in our language? All right, one more quick list. Please write down these lowercase letters. B, D, P, 
and Q. Are they the same symbols flipped around and upside down? Here are some other words you might wonder about. Blood, food, and good. Why don't they rhyme? Well, they used to rhyme. Our language evolved from Old English, a German-Saxon-based language. But think about the history of England. The Saxons, the Normans, those are the French. The Vikings, the Romans, they all came through England and they all affected the language. They brought their words, they changed the sounds of the words that were already there. The Scottish, the Welsh, and the Irish all migrated around too. The language sound shifted. It's called the Great Vowel Shift. Some languages have systems to mitigate how vowels shift. We have a uh, and an. We say an egg and an honor because a uh, egg and a uh, honor are hard to say. Words before and after words change the sound of other words. Good food and blood rhymed when the scribes decided how to spell them. And then Gutenberg created the printing press and codified how we spelled them. But the sounds changed. The exercises we just did demonstrate that our language symbols are one, two, three, or four letters. And the same symbol can have many sounds. Different symbols can have the same sound. And some symbols look a lot alike. This is a lot for pre-K, K, first and second grade. After all, what happens if you flip a chair around or upside down? It's still a chair. When a young child is beginning to recognize letters and their sounds, they might remember that the letter is a ball and stick letter. They might not remember which ones. Kids need to learn in a systematic way. Mastery is essential. For example, we should not expect kids to learn all the ways to make the long A sound right away. This is clearly overwhelming. Students should learn the common ways first, such as vowel constant E, like the word cake or break for car breaks or lemonade. They will also learn soon the vowel team AI comes at the beginning or middle of a word, such as an aid and sale. At the same time, they might learn AY, says long A, at the end of a word, like the words tray or break. Other more difficult spellings are introduced and supported as they come up in reading, but not explicitly taught early on. An example would be the number eight spelled out. Dyslexia can be even more complicated. Double deficit dyslexia adds more to the mix. It's even harder for kids with these issues to learn to read, but with intense instruction they can. Often pneumonic, that mnemonic devices help. Will some of the dyslexia experts who are watching this add their favorite mnemonic devices to the YouTube chat? With good instruction and accommodations, double deficit dyslexic kids can become active citizens. Dyslexia can be comorbid with other conditions. Dysgraphia, trouble with writing and organizing thoughts on paper, is often addressed with dyslexia. Dyscalculia is addressed with direct instruction and multisensory practice in math. Executive function issues can often be helped with good planning and organizational systems taught with direct instruction. These other conditions can be accommodated in schools and with doctor's help. But we have a Matthew effect. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. If you aren't taught to read, you don't like to read, you learn less. If you're not a good reader and you disconnect from school and drop out, who is your community? We have already discussed that learning to read is about 50% hereditary and it's also social. People have asked me if I think our poor literacy instruction is part of the new Jim Crow. And I'm not sure it is that nefarious. Others do think so, but it clearly has the same results. The Annie Casey Kids Count Report was recently released. If the middle class kids didn't have access to tutors and specialized schools, schools or parents that have time and resources to advocate for them, would they score as high? Still, the scores are quite low. If 
people that can read didn't also have the best access to college and careers, would their communities be filled with people that read more easily and with less instruction or with tutors or specialized schools? The Matthew effect goes both ways. All right, this is the next section. I promise to share the hallmarks of good literacy instruction. Anita Archer is an expert in explicit instruction. She explains it as I do, we do, you do. And sometimes it's I do, I do, we do, we do, we do, you do, you do, practice, practice, practice. We explicitly teach reading and spelling together, decoding and encoding. Good instruction is diagnostic and prescriptive. What are the good students not getting or the teachers not teaching? A good instructional leader will check on what the teachers are teaching or not. It is systematic, like addition for multiplication. It is synthetic, based on how sounds are built. Analytic phonics are about taking sounds apart. It's taught with fidelity, not what interests the kid. Examples within fidelity should interest the kids. But if it's not taught with fidelity, it can't line up with assessments. And it's taught to mastery. We may need to circle back and remaster something, but not skip ahead. With music or sports, you don't skip ahead until you master something that you need. If you don't know a chord, you can't play a song that requires that chord. You don't throw small balls quickly at a kid in early phys ed. You start with something like scarves and then rolling big balls, throwing medium softer balls, and then progress to tennis balls and baseballs. You scaffold the instruction, work on mastery, or someone gets frustrated or worse, hurt. And it's not offered once or twice a week. Remediation cannot be short changed if a student is far behind, and especially with contrary instruction in ELA class, which I'll discuss shortly. You'll see how all this echoes the reading rope. We look at five pillars and offer support. This is not phonics only. Phonics are necessary, but not sufficient. And I can't emphasize enough how important background knowledge is and why remediation should never be timed during social studies, science, art, or phys ed. Background knowledge. Helps with vocabulary and comprehension. Teaching sounds before letter names, even if the letter names were, were learned at home, helps with phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, the building blocks. Decodable texts really help with learning the synthetic phonics and will then help you take the words that you can decode and turn them into sight words. Multisensory practice and cursive help with mastery. It helps you really master each of those codes. I'm sorry. Keywords and symbols are used in two ways. With young kids, the symbols can help learn a code like, or a sound, like apple is a short A sound. Keywords and symbols of other kinds help older kids learn to take notes without transcribing a lecture word for word. So most schools use an approach more like reading to learn when kids are still learning to read. It's a lot like dropping a novice skier at the top of a black diamond run, having not taught the fundamentals of skiing on the bunny hill. A few people might have great balance and a sense of body physics, but not many. If you see these things in your school, you know you're probably on the wrong track. We're gonna cross them all out. I'll compare here what's happening in many schools and what ought to happen. We know if you have dyslexia or you grow up in a household where you aren't exposed to much language, you won't arrive at kindergarten with good phonemic awareness or phonological awareness. It needs to be taught. 
Synthetic phonics, or how sounds are built into set syllables and words, should be taught with a scope and a sequence, a scaffold to continue building on. Phonics light, looking at what happens to be in that word, teaching it incidentally, does not work. Guessing that eagle eye or Skippy the frog thing doesn't work. It takes your mind and concentration off the word you're trying to decode. So it doesn't have a chance to make it to your memory bank. The codes don't make it to your memory bank either. Often kids will guess synonyms. They make sense in the story, but they have nothing to do with a printed word. Sometimes someone might guess cottage instead of house or pony instead of horse. These are not the codes they're supposed to be learning. Decodable readers will help you reinforce the codes you've just learned. Leveled readers assume you have a huge word bank. Predictable readers are great for super early reading, helping kids understand that print is important and that pages and books are, have a role. But if they're used too long, kids start memory, memorizing words rather than decoding them. If you simply count the errors, how will you know what to address? If you categorize the errors because the assessments are lined up with your lessons, you can help a student um, reinforce something. You can help a student learn what they missed. For this, scope and sequence must be not only aligned with the other grades in your school, but with the assessments and the decodable tests, texts. Many lessons are not bad in themselves. In fact, they can reinforce something you have already learned, but they don't replace explicit instruction. Even sight words are defined differently. The system on the left works, up, well, the system on the left the common words that you have to memorize are different than the words that have no code or the words that you have successfully decoded and put in your memory bank. The system on the left is a system for once you are reading to learn and you have a great base of words and phrases in your memory bank. It is antithetical to learning to read. Earlier, I had you spell paradoxes and consequences so they would be on your mind. The brain is most plastic in the early years. It takes twice as long to remediate a fourth grader as it does to teach a first grader. Schools use efforts like response to intervention or multi-tiered system of support, and it may take years to help a student. Parents are told that some students take longer to read or they do not, and the parents then do not question the instruction. Some even hear that boys take longer to read than girls or they told that the kids are lazy or not trying. Kids get lay labeled with behavioral issues because the teachers don't understand the source of frustration when students don't keep up with their peers. Worse, this frustration is criminalized and penalized in many schools. There are all sorts of implications, social, emotional, academic, and economic. But several screeners exist. Those that a preschool teacher or a doctor's office could use to determine risk for dyslexia and hopefully drive better instruction. As we understand the neurobiological and genetic underpinnings of dyslexia and learning to read, those screeners are getting better and better. Still, we have to fight for those that are not simply getting poor instruction, whether or not they are neurobiologically dyslexic. Instead, kids get left back in kindergarten or taught the same thing again and again, as if it will work the second time again, around. Or they are sent to ICT or special ed with the same curriculum slowed down. Or with kids that are, have completely different issues. Often the kids are not caught until they have to read to learn in third or fourth grade and they really begin to fail. Dyslexic kids and struggling readers may continue to read more slowly and they fall behind because they, list, they missed a lot of content when they are pulled out for remediation. Good schools offer this remediation early in the morning before classes start or simply during language arts classes. So why is this happening? Where is the expertise? University leaves, leaves teachers, doctors, and social workers unprepared to help struggling readers and their families find pathways to achievement in school and life. 
research in the last 20 years based on fMRI and neurobiological studies have codified how literacy acquisition is hereditary, social, and educational. So these experts should have the information. They don't. Information on this and best practices for reading instruction remains in the domains of neuroscience and psychology and is seldom the focus of teacher preparation programs, medical schools, or schools of social work. Thus, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and the RTI systems fail struggling readers and dyslexic students. We also have a dyslexia industrial complex. There are countless publishers of varying quality and perspective putting out um, curriculum. It's very hard for schools to figure out what might work. Optimally, we train people better pre-service. If teachers were licensed by their ability to teach reading, everything would be different. If pediatricians, school psychologists, and social workers could help families, things would be different. I'm okay with some neuroscientists and some researchers knowing this. They don't all have to know it, but if we, we should continue the research on this. And this is why and why I'm here. Again, I asked you to write the word consequences, not because it's a four syllable hard word, but like I said, I wanted you to have consequences on your mind. These are just some of the consequences and I'll let you read through them. As I said earlier, I argue this is a public health crisis. We saw this during the COVID-19 spring in New York City. Data show, shown that COVID affected black and brown communities more. As people dug into the data, they saw it wasn't just comorbid conditions. It was education and career options that affected our black and brown communities, exposing them to the highly contagious coronavirus. If you weren't taught to read well, what options do you have? Are you not earning enough to fully support a nuclear family and instead living with multiple generations? Are you working a frontline job in a grocery store or a low paying job in a city hospital? People that cannot read are quite disenfranchised. In New York State, our ballot initiatives are not only complicated. If you get help to understand them before going to the voting booth, you must also know that ballot initiative two is directly beneath ballot initiative one. You will find ballot initiative three to the right of one, more like Chinese or Japanese or Korean. What's the impact? Let's look at what we can do instead. If more than 34% of our kids could read at eighth grade level, more could continue their education rather than disconnect. We could see um, how things are progressing based on the reading scores. We know they haven't budged in years. Except in Mississippi, where they've trained every teacher in the science of reading. Schools here that use good literacy instruction have data. Even Success Academy, which will, we will recognize has many other problems, uses structured literacy and offers their extra support first, for first and second grade in the mornings before school. They have 94% of kids proficient in reading. You hear about successful dyslexic people all the time. Damon John and Barbara Corcoran and Kevin O'Leary, all of Shark Tank, are very open about their dyslexia. Damon John's mother helped him with reading comprehension, but he wasn't really diagnosed until he was an adult, and he's still not shy about asking for help. Whoopi Goldberg never learned to read. She dropped out of high school, and she learns her scripts by listening. Jennifer Aniston was misdiagnosed until adulthood, always felt stupid, and she learns her scripts by listening. Anderson Cooper was identified early. He got the proper education. He's also the son of Gloria Vanderbilt. They had the resources to get him all the help he needed. If we had brain scans, Anderson's brain would now look much more like a typical brain, while Damon's, Whoopi's, and Jennifer's would remain looking like a dyslexic brain. 
Moving on to some calls for, to action. We have groups in Albany, Buffalo, Hudson, Long Island, New York City, Ostego, Rochester, and Westchester of decoding dyslexia. And we have a lot of other people working on these issues. Um, so we all connected with uh, Assembly Member Joanne Simon and her guidance memo, which passed a couple years ago. On the New York um, NYSED website, you can find the guidance memo for dyslexia. The 2020 legisl legislation was waylaid by COVID-19, and we need to support our legislators, Joanne Simon, Bobby Carroll, Robert Jackson, to bring it back for 2021. But in my opinion, what might be best, as you probably have figured out by now, is drastic teacher licensing and teacher college accreditation considerations. We could make sure every principal, every K-3 to teacher, and every special ed teacher was licensed by their ability to teach reading. In New York City, we are beginning to create a new culture for the science of reading with the Universal Literacy Program. It trains and places literacy coaches in schools for K-2. to It trains principals and superintendents. COVID-19 also put, took this uh, program um, away for the, temporarily. But all the literacy coaches were put into schools teaching early education. We're gonna hope that we track how their kids do and see how they are progressing in reading compared to the teachers that were not trained. We, um, the United Federation of Teachers in New York has also trained a number of teachers in the Orton-Gillingham approach. We want this program to grow so that kids that miss the universal literacy program also have a path to literacy. We are proposing model schools that will model good literacy programs. And clearly, with remote learning right now, um, could we gather the political will to make sure that all kids have access to the expertise no matter where they live? With remote education, you shouldn't have to go to your zone school or your district school. You should get to go to a teacher that has the expertise you need. And this is the organization I'd like to build. After we conquer the literacy crisis, we can take on other issues that need such cross-pollination and change management. When I gave this presentation to adult dyslexics, the feedback was that I didn't spend enough time on this slide for them to read it and comprehend it. How many people here still struggle to read? This presentation will be available um, in PDF form, and I'll show you the link to that shortly. But I wanted to tell you that I have all the links that I've used in here. I wanted to tell you about some books. Overcoming Dyslexia is usually the first book people read, and it's, it gives you a lot of good information. One thing to know is that Sally Shaywitz's point of view is about um, the creative and dyslexic, and she kind of leaves out people of low IQ and being dyslexic. Frost and the Squid is a really interesting book and takes a longer view, as the title might suggest. It really helps you understand the science of reading. Seiden's Bird Book is the newest, and he updates us with the newest science, and he's more inclusive about how to identify dyslexia. He has great recommendations about what we can do. This is how you can contact me. The bit.ly link on the left, Systemic Solutions, is where we're hosting a version of this in PDF. And you can get all the links there. And finally, you might wonder about this slide at the beginning. The boy on the left is my son. We thought we won the lottery when he got into public progressive school. There, he learned a lot of content. The skills were a byproduct. He was still reading at first or second grade level when we pulled him out and got to the Winward School at fifth grade. At Winward, he learned a lot of skills, but he was so far behind, content was a byproduct. Now I'm pleased to say he is at Bard High School Early College, a screen school. 
On the right is our friend Amir Baraka. He never learned to read in school. He couldn't do his homework and he dropped out of high school. In prison, he learned he was dyslexic. And after he was released, he learned to read. Now both are advocates. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions in this YouTube presentation. Take care.